So I'll read the forward. <clears throat> as the enterprise network expands, as the network, uh, as the enterprise network expands, multi-switched networks are introduced uh, to provide link layer communication between a growing number of end systems. Multi-switched networks are introduced. You can think of it as introducing different layers. Eh? You remember the access layer, the aggregation layer, and the core layer. So that is what we are calling a multi-switched layer. So we have many switches at different layers so that you can be able to support the growing number of end systems. So as new interconnections are formed between multiple enterprise switches, new opportunities for building ever resilient networks are made possible. However, the potential for switching failure as a result of what we call loops. So the solution is we want to make a, a more resilient network, but it brings another problem loops becomes ever more likely. So it is necessary that the spanning tree protocol therefore be understood in terms of behavior in preventing. So actually this is the purpose, main purpose of STP for over 20 years now has been to prevent loops within your switch, uh, within your network, your local area network. So, and how it can be manipulated to suit enterprise network design and performance. <clears throat> so by the end of this chapter, you should be able to. Has Lynn come back? Has Lynn come back? Okay, Benson? Yes. I can read them. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Lynn. We are, we are glad that you are back. Uh, upon completion of this section, you'll be able to describe the issues faced when using a multi-switch network, uh -huh. explain the loop prevention process of the spanning tree protocol, configure param parameters for managing the STP network design. Uh -huh. Wonderful. So, uh, One of the desired, uh, one of the desired attributes of uh, an enterprise network is what we call resilience. Resilience is, uh, you can think of it as the, the ability to recover uh, from failures, from failures, uh, can I say fast? The ability to recover from failures within a very short period of time. Within a very short period of time. As uh, switches increase in your network and you want to plan for scalability, you will most of the time adapt uh, the hierarchical layer or architecture where the switch that interconnects to end devices are referred to the, as access, uh, access layer switches. And you'll also have the aggregation, aggregation layer switches. And also at uh, the top, connecting to the aggregation, you'll have the core layer. Under the core layer, you'll have your router that will interconnect you to your ISP or generally the internet. <clears throat> now, if switch C is uh, connecting uh, hosts, if switch C is interconnecting hosts uh, in, for example, lab C, mm. in order to ensure resilience of our network, we have to provide what we call redundancy, redundancy. So redundancy really is ensuring that we have more than one link. We have more than one link uh, interconnecting to the next layer. 
so that in case in case we have a problem in case we have a problem with one link then the hosts in lab c can still be able to communicate via this particular link so they are not going to be isolated completely so one way in which to make your network more resilient uh, resilient is by providing layer 2 redundancy redundancy uh. <clears throat> so most of the time that is what we do we we we, we do that so that to provide uh, backup in case uh, there is a there is a failure of one of the links Okay, so now uh, the problem again, the problem now with uh, the main problem with uh, redundancy, layer two redundancy, is that uh, they generate what we call switching loops. Mm. Yes, they minimize connection failure which is a big advantage, but then they generate switching loops. Now, what are switching loops? So, uh, if we have a device here and another device here, so maybe we call this host A and we call this guy here host B. So, if host A wants to talk to host B, you want to send a packet to host B, host A must first learn host B's MAC address. To do that, host A will send an ARP request packet, which is a broadcast. So let me just undo that. So let me connect this to that, and uh, maybe that to that. So host A has been connected to switch B, host B has been connected to switch E. So, this guy is going to send an ARP broadcast packet. Uh, sorry. So this broadcast packet uh, is going to be sent out through all the ports, all the ports that are interconnected to switch B. So let me even not follow all of them. Let me just follow uh, this single one. Let me follow, for example, this one. So that packet is going to be forwarded here. When switch A receives that broadcast packet, again, it's going to forward it out through all the interfaces, like that. So it's also going to forward it via that interface up to here. Uh, when this guy receives that packet, when this guy receives that packet switch E, because it's a broadcast packet, it's going to forward it out through all the other interface other than the interface that received that broadcast packet. Therefore, it's going to send to this guy and it's also going to send to this guy. But I want you to see that we've already created a loop. We've already created a loop here. Uh, so this packet can keep wandering and there are going to be so many of such uh, like packets in a very short while. Uh, and it's going to cause uh, it's going to cause what we call a, a broadcast storm. The, bro the problem with the broadcast storm is that you'll have congestion in your network. That will uh, drastically uh, deteriorate the efficiency of your network because bandwidth will be consumed and it will cause major interruptions uh, of the communication service to occur. So that's the main problem with uh, trying to introduce redundancy in order to improve resilience of a network. It brings the problem of loops. So these are the specific problems of switching loops. The first one is what I've just explained. It's called the broadcast storm. The broadcast storm. So as I've explained, when this guy needs to communicate to this guy, they must first generate, in order to learn their MAC address, they must generate a broadcast packet. That broadcast packet uh, should be uh, 
that ARP request should be a broadcast. So it's gonna be sent here. This guy is gonna also send it here. This guy will send it here and also send it here like that. This guy will again, I mean, it's okay here. So at I tuma tena hapa, so it arudi penye ilitoka, then at I tuma through this interface, we are ki ipokea, ivyo, ivyo, ivyo. So kutakuwa na packets mingi zinakuwa duplicated. So broadcast storm in a course packet duplication. Eh? Na pia in a course, so e duplication do in a course uh, uh, bandwidth kukua consumed completely. Hmm. So that's the problem. That's the first problem with uh, broadcast storms. The second problem is called MAC address instability. MAC address table instability. MAC address table instability. So that again is caused by the switching loop. So let's look at this. <clears throat> so when host A sends the ARP request, host B is going to update. Once it receives that request, it's going to update its MAC address table. That, hey, I have received this frame from a device whose MAC address is that, and it has been connected through that particular interface, G0 stroke 0 stroke 0. So you can see that there. Mm. OK, so what happens? After updating its MAC address table, it's going to forward that frame uh, to switch A via G002. It's also going to forward it to this switch. Mm. Now, in this particular example, uh, we, let's stop following switch A and focus on switch C. So switch C will send this frame to host B, which is okay, but we'll also send it to switch A again via this interface here. Switch A again will forward this frame after receiving it back to switch B. Now switch B will look at the MAC address of this frame and see that it's the MAC address of host A. Therefore, it's going to delete it's going to delete this first entry of host A and update the new entry. That if I want to go to host A, I need to use G002, which is not correct. Which is not correct. So because of the loop, we are going to have MAC address table instability. So that is what we call MAC address table instability. So it will update the new entry, which is totally wrong. Uh, and this particular entry will make host A unreachable uh, because anytime host B receives a packet whose destination MAC address is A, it's going to forward it out through G002, which is not correct. Uh, so I itafikia host A. Yes, so you, you have a question? I just want to request you to repeat that uh, uh, that area of mark instability. I'm somehow hanging. Okay, okay. So, so let me do it again. <clears throat> so, if host A needs to send to host B, host A must learn the MAC address of host B. How does it do that? It generates an ARP request packet. The ARP request packet is a broadcast packet. So the switch, it will have all Fs on its uh, ARP header. Not ARP actually, but Ethernet 2 header. Eh? So this, this frame is going to be forwarded out through all the interfaces of switch B, including this interface. So when this broadcast packet arrives to switch C, so it is also going to forward it out through all its interfaces, there and also there. Switch A is also going to forward it out through all its interfaces, so there. Now, let's go back to this particular 
frame. When this frame is received by switch B, switch B will update its MAC address table that, hey, this guy whose MAC address is this is connected to G stroke zero stroke zero stroke three. And that is correct. Now the problem is when switch A receives this frame, when switch B receives this frame from switch A due to the loop that we have here, it's gonna update, it's gonna update its MAC address table. How does it update? Number one, it deletes the previous entry. Then does a new entry. It does a new entry. Because it will check on this frame, it will check the source MAC address on this frame. And therefore it will say that uh, this particular device with this MAC address is on G stroke zero stroke zero stroke two. And that is not correct. So that particular issue is what we are calling MAC address instability. MAC address table instability. Mm. And what is it exactly? Receiving previously forwarded uh, frames generates false MAC address entries and instability uh, within the MAC address table. So is that clear? Oyo? Okay. It's clear. Okay, Sante. Okay, so how do we resolve? How do we resolve these particular issues, broadcast storms and MAC address instability? For the longest period and existence of local area networks, that is over 20 years, the solution for this particular problem of switching loops has always been to use STP, STP. So how does STP work? Uh, in STP, loops are eliminated by restricting traffic flow over redundant paths. So how do we restrict this traffic flow over redundant paths? By blocking. We block uh, any particular path that can can be able to generate a switching loop so when we block that interface then that interface cannot forward data so if a if host a wants to send to host b it will generate a broadcast the broadcast will be sent here and it will also be sent here but this interface has been blocked, therefore, it's simply going to discard that particular packet. Then this one is going to forward it here, and this one is going to forward it to host B. And therefore, we have a loop free. We have a loop free. Uh, we have a loop free uh, switching network. So how STP is able to do that? is what we are supposed to understand in the coming slides. So how does STP block certain ports in order, in order to prevent switching loops? Now generally, um, STP or spanning tree protocol normally forms what we call uh, forms an inverted an inverted tree type architecture an inverted it forms an inverted tree type architecture now at the logical at the logical center, at the logical center of this particular inverted tree type architecture, we have what we call the root bridge. In regards to the STP, the switch will be also referred to as a bridge. Most of the time we'll be talking about a root bridge. And therefore, 
A root bridge is simply a root switch. When you talk of a logical center, here, this particular switch is at the logical center. And therefore, it's called the root. So the logical center is simply not the same as the physical center. That is this kind of topology, the inverted tree type architecture is actually created logically and not physically like you've interconnected those devices like this. Mm -hmm. Now, in STP, uh, in STP we have two types of switches. The first one is referred to as the root bridge. And the second one, not really the second one, but all the rest are referred to as non-root bridges. Non-root bridges. Sometimes we also call this a designated bridge or a designated switch. And we can also call this non-designated, non-designated bridge. So those are the two types of switches. And as you can see in this particular example, this is the root bridge and all the rest, all the rest are non-root bridges, non-root bridges. The other important thing to understand here is that when we are transmitting a uh, data from the root to these uh, switches at the bottom of the tree, we commonly refer to that as uh, downstream, downstream, downstream. When we are transmitting from a downstream switch, to the towards the root, we call that upstream. Upstream. So generally, non-root bridges are considered to be downstream switches uh, from the root from the root bridge. And generally. Uh, communication will always flow, as I've showed you, using these arrows from the root bridge to the downstream switches via other non non root bridges. So please remember some of those basic things that we've mentioned here: root bridge or designated, non root bridge or non designated. Yeah. A bridge is simply a switch. When you talk of downstream switches, there are switches that are below the root bridge. Upstream, when we are sending data towards the root bridge. Okay. So let's look at what we call the bridge ID. Uh, generally, the bridge identifier, uh, the bridge identifier is generally used to elect the root bridge is used to elect the root bridge. Now, the bridge identifier is made up of two parts. So two parts of a bridge ID. The first part is called the bridge priority. The next part is called the MAC address. The MAC address of that particular switch bridge priority now the bridge priority is actually uh, made up of 16 bits it's made up of 16 bits the mac address as usual is actually 48 48 bits so now you need to understand how this is used to elect the root bridge. Eh? Now, generally, the device or the switch, let me use switch or the bridge. The, the bridge 
with the smallest the, the, the switch with the smallest uh, bridge ID with the smallest bridge ID is elected as the root bridge with the smallest root ID is elected with as the root bridge now how do we do that number one we compare Number one, we compare the bridge priority. So the one with the smallest, smallest priority, priority becomes or is elected, is elected root. Number two, if bridge ID are the same or bridge priority are the same, then we go ahead and look at the, we, we, we compare the MAC address. We compare the MAC. So the one with the smallest, smallest MAC is elected as the root. So don't forget that uh, little theory there. Uh, so 16 bits bridge ID. This is how it looks like. So these very first parts are actually 16 bits, like 1496 there. Then this is the MAC address. So this is what we call the bridge priority. Then this is the MAC address. And this whole thing is now what we call the bridge ID, the combination of the bridge priority together with the MAC address. Now, another thing to note is that the bridge priority, the bridge priority can be manipulated, can be changed. The bridge ID can be manipulated through altering of the bridge priority. In order to give a certain switch uh, the ability to be a root, especially if the switch is a powerful, is a more powerful switch in order to support what we call an optimized network design. So the default, the default bridge ID is 32768. So that's the default. That's the default. But if you want this particular switch to be the root during the STP election, then you can, you can reduce the value of the bridge ID. So the one with the smallest bridge ID will be elected as the root. And that's why in this example, this particular switch is actually the root. So I hope you've understood about the bridge ID. Any question here before we move forward? Wonderful. So let's move on. So here we want to look at what we call the BPDU, the Bridge Protocol Data Unit. Bridge Protocol Data Unit. So let's look at what the BPDU is. Now, the BPDU is used to facilitate communication within the spanning tree network. And uh, we have two types of BPDUs, BPDUs. Number one is what you call the configuration, BPDU, BP, BPDU. And number two, we have what we call the topology change notification, BPDU. This one is sent downstream from root to non-root bridges. On the other hand, this one here is sent upstream, sent upstream from non-root 
from an root to the root bridge. So those are the two types of BPDUs. We are going to learn about the TCN or topology change notification BPDU in a coming slide. But right now, let's focus on the configuration BPDU. Now, the root bridge, the root bridge uh, uses what we call a hello timer. We're going to look at other timers too. The hello timer, uh, to be precise, is actually set at two seconds. So at, after every two seconds, the root bridge, the root bridge sends a configuration BPDU to the downstream switches. Mm, switches uh, in order to alert them that it is still alive. Just saying that, hey, I am still the president. I am still the president. Uh, so that is what the configuration BPDU is used for. The configuration BPDU will usually carry a number of parameters that are used to determine the presence of the root bridge and to ensure that the root bridge remains the bridge with the highest priority within your switching network. So uh, we are going to look at some of uh, uh, these fields much later, but you can, you can think of this as the fields of a bridge protocol data unit. So it will have the protocol ID, the protocol VLAN identifier, PVID, but most important, in this field which you are looking at now, the BPDU type, it can either have the value configuration or TCN. Now, the other thing it will have is the root bridge ID. No, the root ID, uh, the root bridge ID is what is uh, uh, entered here. What we call the root path cost, which we're going to look at in the next slide. Then you have the bridge ID, which is the ID of that particular uh, switch. Then we have the port ID, which is what we call the designated port ID, which we're going to talk about in a short while. Then some timers here. So one of those timers we've already looked at is uh, the hello timer, which is set to two seconds. So we also have another one called the maximum edge and the message edge timers, which we're going to look at. And of course here we also have uh, another field called the forward delay. Now, let me just clear everything. So as you can see here, we have the root bridge and it will, it will generate and send. It will generate and send uh, the BPDU to the downstream switches. Eh? Now, the other thing you need to understand is that when this switch receives, when this switch receives the BPDU, it's going to create its own BPDU and send it down uh, to the downstream switch. So this switch is going to create its own BPDU. So it's important that you note that, that this switch is going to create its own BPDU and send it, and send it to the downstream switch. Why is it creating its own BPDU? So that number one, it can also share its own bridge ID, its own bridge ID with the downstream switches uh, its own bridge ID, while still advertising who the root bridge is. Uh. Now, uh, the, the election, the election of a root is what we call, uh, in, in STP, Election of a root in STP is what we describe as preemptive. Preem, preem, preemptive. Preemptive election. Preemptive. Preemptive means if another switch is added to your switching network and it has a better 
it has a better bridge ID, then it will prompt an election. It will prompt a new election. It will prompt a new election. We are going to see other protocols that also have elections that are non-preemptive. 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 So elections that are non-preemptive are like our, our elections in Kenya. If we've elected a president like Uhuru Kenyatta, however bad he gets, no one else can come and claim to be a better president and therefore we go into an election. No, his presidency is protected by the constitution for a period of five years until we hold a new election. So that is a non-preemptive election. Otherwise, a preemptive election, if we elected, uh, for example, Rafael Tuju, and tomorrow we see Molimudida can be a better president, we, we go into elections again. So it's good that you also understand the difference between preemptive and a non-preemptive uh, election. And that's why when, when we are creating the new BPDU, we, we, we include the root bridge ID. Uh, so that if any switch gets this particular BPDU and they compare their bridge ID with a root bridge ID and they see that it's a better one, then they'll start uh, claiming to be the root and an election will be, will be, will be done. Okay. So let's look at what we call the path cost. Sorry. Path cost. Now, the path cost, uh, the path cost is uh, a value, is a value that is associated with what you call the root pot, the root pot. We are going to see what the root pot is in a short while, the root pot. Mm -hmm. Generally, the root pot offers what we call the shortest path. The root pot, the root pot is usually on the non-root bridges and it offers the shortest path to the root. So each root pot is associated with a certain cost, a certain value, uh, which is called the path cost. The path cost. So for example, in this particular bridge, in this particular bridge, this is the root pot because it offers the shortest distance. It offers the shortest distance to the root because we can also come this way and then this way. Uh, but this one is the one that offers the shortest distance. So it is associated with this value here, 2,000, 20,000. So that's what we call the path cost. Similarly in this one, uh, that is the root pot here. This is the root pot. Yeah, this is the root pot, and therefore they are associated with that particular value. Now, from understanding the path cost, you need to understand what we call RPC. RPC is the root path cost, the root path cost. So the root path cost is used to measure the cost of the path to the root bridge. The, the cost of the path to the root bridge in order to determine the spanning tree shortest path. The root path cost used to measure the shortest cost of the path to the root bridge in order to determine the spanning tree shortest path. RPC, now generally, RPC is the sum of the path cost, all the way from the root 
to, to, to the downstream switches. Eh? So let me explain that. So this is the root. So the RPC from the root itself actually has a value of zero. Sorry. The RPC from the root is zero because we've not passed through any root port. Now, when it passes this bridge, we are going to add the value, the path cost here, which is 2,000. Therefore, the RPC is going to be uh, 20,000. Now, if we had another switch, if we had another downstream switch here, if we had another uh, downstream switch there, then the RPC, the RPC here, RPC here will now be 40,000 because we've added this to 20,000, then added this 20,000. So the RPC here will be 40,000. So that is what we call the root path cost, used to measure the cost of the path to the root bridge in order to determine the spanning tree shortest path. So they're highly related, RPC and also the path cost. And that's why you see here on a BPDU, on a BPDU, we have a field to carry the root path cost, the RPC. Okay, so let's move on. So we have, uh, in the industry, we have different types of uh, path costs. But uh, generally, path costs are related to the speed of the interface. The higher the speed in all these different standards, the higher the speed, the lower the path cost value. Hmm. So for Huawei, we used uh, this standard called 802.1T, a common question in the exam again. 802.1T standard is the one that is used by Huawei switches. So it's important to understand that. Okay, so a port that is, that can process data at 100 megabits per second will be associated with this cost, 199.999. If it is processing at one gigabit per second, and then it will be associated with 20,000. If it's 10 gig, it's gonna be associated with the cost of 2,000. So, from these values, we can create the RPC, the root path cost for each bridge. So let's look at the spanning tree port rolls. Um, STP has uh, three port rolls. The very first one is called the designated port, the next one is called the root port, and lastly we have a port called the alternate, alternate port. So you need to understand uh, how each of these particular, uh, how these, each of these uh, ports actually enable STP to function in order to avoid switching loops. So the designated port, uh, where well, here? Yeah. Designated port is used to to send uh, BPDUs, BPDUs to downstream switches, to downstream switches. Then you have the root port, root port. Uh, is the port that offers uh, the shortest path to the the shortest path uh, to the root bridge to the root bridge. So of course this is based on the root path cost. 
Ethernet port uh, is actually a redundant, a redundant uh, port that is blocked. That is blocked in order to prevent, in order to prevent switching loops. The alternate port. Ladies and gentlemen, are you still there? Yes. The problem I'm with online there. teaching is sometimes you you feel too lonely. You see, you're not seeing people. They're not talking. You've asked them to mute their mics. It can get quite lonely at times. Okay. So, to Misema, STP, on how many patrols? Someone to read for us the those three portals. The first one. Designated port. Number two. Two port. And lastly. Alternate. Alternate port. The alternate port. Very important. Okay, so don't forget that. Mm -hmm. So, on the root bridge. All the ports are actually designated ports because this is where BPDUs originate from. Now, to me, because they are designated ports, you could send BPDUs to the downstream switches. So that's why this port is also going to be a designated port. This one is going to be a designated port. This one is going to be a designated port. This one is going to be a designated port. We're going to talk about this much later, why this is a designated and why this is an alternate. So I hope you understood what a designated port is. So the next one is uh, the root port. So the port that offers the shortest path to the root on every switch. I hope it's even visible even from this, this diagram. So it offers the shortest RPC to the root that port will be made the root port, the root port. And lastly, lastly, we have the alternate port, the alternate port, which is usually blocked, blocked to prevent switching loops. So this particular interface here will be blocked because if we let it if, if we don't block it, the, we're going to have a loop here between these three switches. So STP will block this port. So how does it choose between blocking this one or this one? Mm. That is something we are going to look at in a short while. But in the meantime, know that even though, even though the alternate port does not forward data and process data, it is still able to receive BPDUs it is still able to receive BPDUs. Yeah. And in the case that, for example, the root port of this particular device goes down, if that particular uh, 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 port goes down, this one goes down, this root port here, uh, then automatically STP is going to realize that and enable this as the new root port. So actually, the alternate port acts as the backup to the root port of a particular bridge. Now it's quite too much I'm saying, but I hope you just understand it uh, uh, from that theory perspective. That if the root port goes down, then the alternate port will be unblocked. So we have a failure in this link. So this one will be unblocked. And that's why it is important that it is able to receive BPDUs. So we'll see uh, how it's able to know when there is failure within the network. So we use what we call the port ID, uh, the port identifier, port ID. So the port ID is made up of two parts. What we call uh, the port priority 
And number two, the port number. So let's look at this example to understand the purpose of the port ID. So this is actually the port ID. So it's made up of, uh, no, this is not the port ID. This is the root bridge ID. Eh? Root bridge ID for that particular bridge. Root bridge ID for that particular bridge. Eh? Now, here, this guy is the root. Why has he been elected the root? It has the lowest bridge priority. The lowest bridge priority. Now, we've already said that on the root bridge, on the root bridge, all ports uh, assume the designated port role because all of them are forwarding BPDUs. Eh? Then we said that the root port, the root port is the port that offers the shortest path to the root. Uh, we know that the RPC, the RPC from the root is actually zero. So in this case, so here, RPC, RPC is zero. So in this case, this particular interface is going to be the root bridge because it offers the shortest path to the root. Now, on the other hand, in this particular switch, two interfaces offer the same RPC. Two interfaces offer the same RPC of zero to the root. So which one is going to be, which one is going to be chosen as the root port and which one is going to be disabled in order to avoid a switching loop? So which one is going to assume the alternate port role? So in order to choose which one is going to be chosen as the root, root port and which one is going to be blocked, it looks at the port ID. So first of all, it compares the port priority. By default, by default, all ports have a priority of 128. And this particular value, uh, and actually the range can be between zero to 240 in increments, in increments of 16. Uh, so the default bridge uh, port uh, priority is 128, eh? but you can assign, you can assign your port, you can alter the port priority and give it a priority of 16 or 32 uh, 32 plus 16 is uh, 48, eh? 48, uh, 64. So you can you can give it any of those. So it has to be in increments of 16. So that is what I'm saying there. But the default uh, priority is 128. So in this particular example, uh, these two, these two interfaces on this bridge have a priority of 128 have a port priority of 128. So when there is a tie on the port priority, it goes on to compare the port numbers, which will never be the same. Because one port number will be 001, then another one 002, then another one 003. So using that particular uh, format, it, it, checks, it checks the port number. That one has a port number of one. This one has a port number of two. And therefore, the one with the lowest, the one with the lowest port number or really port ID is made the root port while the other interface is blocked. So this one is going to be blocked and therefore it's going to act as the alternate port. So that is how we use the port ID. Interesting, right? Yeah. Am I am I alone? Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Come on, Jeff. Ah, oh, sound. Yes, yeah, we can hear you, Teacher Kevin. Asante, son. I really appreciate people who respond. 
mm. when I ask, at least you you make me feel as if I'm I'm with someone. Okay. So any anyone with a question about the port ID or any other thing that we've learned so far? Okay. So in Manisha Kinaeleweka. Now let's look at uh, what we call the STP timers. Mm. STP timers, we have three. We have what we call the hello timer. We have what we call the message age timer. And lastly, we have what we call the maximum age timer. So you need to understand each of these timers and how they are used. We already talked about the hello timer, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. After every two seconds, the root bridge will generate a BPDU to be sent to the downstream switches. For what purpose? For what purpose? To alert the downstream switches that it's still the root. So that's the hello timer. Now that BPDU, that BPDU that is being sent after every two seconds has several fields has several fields here. Two of those fields, these are the three timers, but two of those fields are the message age field and the maximum age field. So we want to see how they use these particular fields uh, in order to facilitate uh, communication. Okay. Now, we said that when this device receives this, PD, the, this BPDU, it generates its own, it creates its own BPDU and send it to the downstream switches. Now, the amount of time it takes for it to create a new BPDU and send it uh, to, the, to the other switch is actually, Excuse me, it's actually one second. One second. And this one second is commonly referred to as a, a pro propagation, propagation delay, propagation delay. So it takes one second before you can generate your own BPDU and send it to the downstream switches. Uh, so generally, it means for this BPDU to come here, uh, no, let, let me just, uh, uh, create another another switch here. So if we have another switch here, if we have another switch there, in case, uh, let me see. Okay, so let, let's let's follow this BPDU. So when this BPDU comes here, it's gonna take one second before we forward it again here. So the propagation delay here is one second. It's gonna take another one second before we forward it here. So in total, it will take about, it will actually take two seconds, not more than two seconds, before the BPDU gets to this particular downstream switch here. Uh, so from that propagation delay, we they came up with the message edge timer and the maximum edge timer uh, in order to, in order to uh, in order to be able to detect when there is a problem uh, with the root bridge. Okay, so let's begin with the maximum edge timer. Uh, let me. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the maximum edge timer by default is 20 seconds. Is 20 seconds. Now, once once a uh, once a, a bridge receives a BPDU, it actually resets. It resets the value of, uh, let me just say that again, 
So once this particular device receives, once it receives this particular BPDU, so this is a BPDU, eh? The BPDU will have the message edge set to zero and the maximum edge set to 20. So when it receives this particular BPDU, it's gonna start counting down. So in terms of seconds, so 20, 19, 18, blah, 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 like that, like that. So it's gonna count down. It's gonna count down the maximum edge. 20, 19, 18, like that, like that. And I'm gonna tell you why. Now, let's also understand uh, the maximum edge timer. The maximum edge timer uh, is actually updated. Uh, that is, it's incremented, incremented by one at each bridge, at each bridge. So you can see in this example, when, when we are getting a BPDU from the root bridge, the message edge will be zero. But when we create a new root, uh, bridge, a, a new BPDU to pass it, to forward it to the lower switches, we increment it by one. Why are we incrementing it by one? Because as I said, it takes one second for us to create this one, to create a new uh, BPDU and forward it downwards. So when we forward again, uh, this BPDU to the downstream switch, we also update the message edge. So what is the purpose of the maximum edge then? Eh? So the maximum edge timer, the maximum edge timer, uh, as I said, is usually, uh, it counts down. It counts down. And it will expire any time this maximum edge becomes greater than the message edge. So what this means is this. This is counting down, but any time this maximum edge becomes, uh, ah, actually it's the message edge. Anytime the message edge, anytime the message edge becomes greater than the maximum edge, it means that by now I should have received the BPDU. And therefore, if I have not received a BPDU, it means we have a failure in this topology. So when you get time, you'll need to now read slowly in order to understand uh, what I've just explained. It may not be easy to understand for the first time, but that is really what is happening. When the maximum edge, this one is counting down. This one is being incremented by one. So anytime this becomes bigger than this in any switch, it means that by now we should have received another BPDU and therefore updated our maximum edge. So that is how we are able to identify failures. So if in this switch, the maximum edge becomes greater than, uh, uh, the message edge becomes greater than the uh, maximum edge, it means we have a failure somewhere. So maybe this switch has gone down or that link has gone down or that switch or that one, or even the root bridge. So when that happens, it triggers what we call a topology change notification, BPDU, which we are going to see in a short while. So how is the election done? How is the election done? So generally, initially, everyone assumes that they are the president or the root bridge. So everyone sends to everyone else a BPDU claiming to be the root bridge. So everyone says, hey, I'm the root, I'm the root, I'm the root, everyone sends. Now, anytime you receive a superior BPDU, a superior BPDU is the BPDU that has a lower bridge ID. So these are the bridge ID. And in the BPDU, people will indicate their bridge ID. So anytime you receive a superior BPDU, you stop claiming 
uh, to be the root and you start advertising that other person uh, uh, in, in your BPDU, in the root, uh, you remember this one? You remember this particular, this particular field here, the root ID? In the root ID field, instead of now continuing to use your, your, your bridge ID in the root ID field of your BPDU, you start advertising that other person who has a superior BPDU than yours. So that is how the election is actually done. That is how the election is done. So let's look at the portal establishment. I think I already explained most of the things that are being said here. So we, we can just go through it again. Uh, we can even begin from the election. So these are the bridge IDs, the bridge IDs. Uh, in this particular case, all of them have the same bridge priority. So the election really will be based on the MAC address. And from this particular example, switch A is the root, meaning that this MAC address is the, is the smallest. So, portal establishment. We have three portals, as we said earlier, designated, root port, and alternate. So every port on a root bridge will be designated. Then the root port offers the least RPC. Root port offers the least RPC. The shortest distance to the root. Then uh, here we have these two. We, we have these two switches and now here, we want to see which link are we supposed to block between these two switches? Which one are we supposed to block uh, in order to prevent a loop from occurring? So in this particular example, again, we look at what we call the port priority. No, not really port priority. Here we are going to look at the bridge ID. We're going to look at the bridge ID because these are different switches. Eh? So we look at the bridge ID. So whoever has the smaller bridge ID is going to be now a designated port. Remember designated ports are used to forward BPDUs to downstream switches. Then the one that is, the one that is, uh, has a higher value so this one has a f higher value, I think, compared to this, uh, this bridge ID. So the one that has a higher value of the bridge ID becomes the alternate port. So the alternate port is going to be blocked. So in, uh, in STP, only designated ports, only designated ports and root ports can be able to forward data alternate port is blocked in order to avoid the loop. So you see here, we cannot, we cannot have a loop because if any data is sent, it cannot come to this interface. It cannot be forwarded beyond, it cannot, we cannot send out data through this interface and we cannot also send data to it because it will discard it. So let's now look at the port states. Another very important concept in STP. So in STP we have five, if I'm not wrong, we have five port states. Uh, 
Now, these post-its really are used to determine a number of things. Mm. Number one, mm. whether, uh, whether a port can or cannot forward data. Number two, uh, whether uh, a port can or cannot learn MAC addresses. So that is really what you're supposed to understand. So let's begin at the disabled state. Any port that is either administratively disabled, that is it has been shut down, uh, or it has not been connected to another interface and therefore it's physically down, is thought of as being on the disabled state, disabled state. When you undo shutdown or when you connect an interface to an end device or to another switch or a router, then the physical status will change to up. When the physical status changes to up, that particular port will transit from the disabled state to the blocking state. In, block, in disabled state, of course, it cannot forward data, user traffic, it cannot learn MAC addresses. Similarly, on the blocking state, it cannot forward data and it can also not learn MAC addresses. In case you're still, a port is still on a blocking state and you shut it down again or disconnect it physically, it goes back to the disabled state. Then we have the listening state. The listening state uh, enables communication of BPDU information uh, following negotiation of the portal in STP. So in blocking state, you, ah, no, in listening state, sorry. So from blocking state, you, you, you move to listening state. So listening state, you can be able to get STP BPDUs, STP BPDUs, so that you can decide on the port roles. So that is what we call listening, so that you can decide on the port roles, designated, uh, what else, alternate, and root port. So at the listening state, again, you cannot forward data and you cannot learn MAC addresses at the listening state. Now, on the listening state, after STP is complete, you can also, you can also go, go back to the blocking state if your port role is alternate. So after STP, Meisha, listening ni STP na take place, you simply go back. If you are an alternate port, you go to blocking state so that you cannot be able to forward data, but you can still be able to receive BPDUs even in blocking states. So that is, I think that is another thing that I, uh, whether you can receive, receive STP BPDUs. B, 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 Us. So both in blocking state and listening state, you can receive STP BPDUs. In disabled state, you cannot because you're shut down. Okay, so let's move on. So you can now, before you begin learning MAC addresses, so you've been selected as either the root port or the designated port before you start learning MAC addresses, you'll have to wait for, uh, uh, I think, some 15 seconds. 
what we call the forwarding delay, some 15 seconds before you're able to transit to learning. Mm. In the learning state, you can learn MAC addresses, but you cannot forward data, but you can receive STP BPDUs and process them. So that is the learning state. Now, again, from the learning state, from the learning state, you can go to now the forwarding state. So in the forwarding state, you can forward data now. That's the only time you can forward data. You can also learn MAC addresses and you can receive STP BPDUs and also process them. Again, the transition from learning to forwarding also has a forwarding delay of 15 seconds. 15 seconds. So generally for a port to transit from the disabled state to the forwarding state, it will take about 30 seconds in STP. It will take about 30 seconds in STP. So those are some of the things that you need to understand about these port states. Now, the purpose of this forward delay, 15 seconds and 15 seconds timer, eh? it, it is used to ensure that the BPDU information has reached all the switches within the network before you can be able to either learn or forward data. Hmm? So that is the purpose of this particular forwarding delay. So it's important to also remember that. I was just trying to remember what I had forgotten, okay. So what happens when the root bridge fails? What happens when the root bridge fails? Uh, so when the root bridge fails, of course, downstream switches are not going to receive BPDUs. When you don't receive your BPDU, remember you have your maximum age, which is counting down. When the message age becomes greater than the maximum age, election begins again. So everyone starts claiming to be the root bridge. Uh, uh, so after the maximum age, the message age becomes greater than the maximum age, then non root bridges wait for the maximum age before assuming the loss of a root. So when the maximum age expires, countdown, 20, 19, 18, anytime the message age becomes greater than the maximum age, it expires. And everyone begins saying that, hey, I am the president. I am the president. And the election begins again. So that is what happens when a root bridge fails. Uh, now, it is important to remember that as we said earlier, the maximum age is actually 20 seconds. The maximum age by default is 20 seconds. So it will count down from 20, 18, 19. And therefore, generally, for, for an ST, STP uh, network, for an STP network to reconverge, re reconverge is for it to recover from failure, for example, the root, the root has failed. So for it to recover from that failure, it has to take into account, it's going to take this amount of time, what we call the forward, the forward delay. You remember the forward delay we had from listening to learning and from learning to forwarding, each 15 seconds. So in total, in total 30 seconds. Again, for us to detect the failure, the maximum age has to expire, which, which ideally can take up to a maximum of 20 seconds. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, we, we normally say that it takes about 30 to, 30 to 50 seconds. 
30 for, uh, to 50 seconds for an STP network to reconverge. Why, why 50 here? Because this 50, we are adding it 30 plus 20. This 20 cannot always be 20 because really it depends. It depends on uh, where the switch is on the inverted tree architecture. So remember that in today's network, in today's network, this period, this period is just too high. In today's networks, this period is too high. We cannot have a downtime of about a minute every time we have a failure, either a link failure or the root bridge failure within our network. It's too high. For that particular problem, a new version of STP was created, which you're going to learn as the next topic known as RSTP. And at this point, let me just talk. Uh, so we have uh, three types, three types of STP. The first one is called STP. Then the improvement of STP is called RSTP. And we also have what you call the multiple spanning tree. Uh, I'm mentioning the multiple spanning tree because uh, in STP, you can only have one tree in a local area network. So you cannot have more than one, one inverted tree architecture, more than one STP process running when you're using STP. Similarly, in RSTP, you can only also do one tree. Now, when you learn HCIP and HCIE, you're going to learn about multiple spanning tree. With multiple spanning tree, you can have uh, one or more trees within the same local area network. Uh -huh. By default, Huawei switches uses MSTP, the multiple spanning tree. That's the mode that it uses by default. Uh, why RSTP takes about uh, 50 seconds, 30 to 50 seconds to reconverge. So we need another one that can take a shorter time. So it's called RSTP. Okay. I'm going a little bit slow because this topic is important. So what happens when we have an indirect link failure? So, oh, what did I do? An indirect link failure uh, can occur when, for example, you shut down an interface. So for example, uh, so far we understand that this will be a designated port. This will also be a designated port because they are from the root bridge. We know that this port here will be a root port. On the other hand, this port here is a designated port because if this is alternate, then this one is designated. We also know that this port here is a root port because it offers the shortest path to the root from switch C. So what happens? What happens if this, if this interface uh, fails? Maybe it's shut down or it has a, a physical problem. So when that happens, it means even though the root will be sending, even though the root will be sending BPDUs, this guy is not going to receive it. So when the maximum edge when the maximum edge expires, then this guy is going to generate a BPDU and send that BPDU to switch C, claiming that, hey, I am the president. I am the president. Mm -hmm. So once that happens, the alternate port here is blocked but can still listen for BPDUs. So once that happens, when this receives, that particular uh, uh, BPDU, it's gonna compare it with the BPDU from the root. If this one is uh, greater, then it's going to inform this guy that no, uh, switch A has a better BPDU. Uh, so when this guy gets that message, then switch B is going to know that, oh, it seems my root port has actually has actually, uh, it seems my root port has actually failed. So what am I supposed to do? 
Mm. So what am I supposed to do? I will simply re-enable. Uh, I will simply tell this guy to enable their blocked port so that now I change this port, which was my designated port. I change it now to I change it now to a root port. So this will be my new root port. So that is how STP handles what you call an indirect link failure. Mm -hmm. Of course, this will take about 50 seconds in order for it to recover because the alternate port will have to transit. It will have to transit sit from blocking all the way to forwarding. Again, before we decide that indeed we've lost connection with the root bridge, it will take the maximum edge has to expire about 20 seconds. So you see, that's the problem, about 50 seconds for it to recover from this failure. Okay, so let's look at the, a direct link failure. So what happens when you have a direct link failure? We had already, already looked at uh, this particular kind of uh, connection where we have uh, where we have two interfaces that offer the same RPC. So how do we choose again? How do we choose which one is the root and which one we block in order to avoid a loop? We look at the port ID. The port ID has a port priority and a port number. The one with the smaller one becomes the root. So in this case, this guy is the root. And this guy is the alternate. So what happens? What happens if this guy, if this guy actually goes down? So because it belongs to this switch, this switch can easily, uh, after the maximum age expires, that is after almost 20 seconds, this guy will simply enable. Uh, in fact, not after 20 seconds. I immediately, this goes down. The switch knows that this is my root and I have a backup, uh, the alternate port. So it will immediately enable this port. So this port will have to transit uh, from the blocking state all the way to the forwarding state, which will take about 30, uh, 30 seconds. Eh? 30 seconds because of the forwarding delay that we talked about. So that is how we can recover from a direct link failure. It takes lesser time uh, compared to the, uh, the other one in, in indirect link failure. Okay, so are you guys still there? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm still yes. there. Yes, yes. Ah, wonderful. Okay, so we've already seen those failures that can occur, indirect and also direct link failures. Now, by default, uh, by default, the entries of a MAC address table, they take, uh, they remain valid and within the MAC address table for about five minutes, 300 seconds. Hmm. But when we have a failure, then this particular change can cause what we call a MAC address table instability. Hmm. It can cause instability. So how? Let's look at this example. So we have host A here. This port has been blocked alternate. So if host A needs to talk to host B, if host A needs to talk to host B, they'll send a packet to this switch. Switch B will send it to switch A. Switch A will send it to switch C. And finally, this will send it here. Because 
the alternate port here has been blocked. So we, we can send a packet there in order to avoid a loop. Now, let me get rid of that. Now what happens, what happens when this root, when this root port goes down? We've already said that when that happens, uh, this guy is going to be enabled. Uh, this guy is going to be enabled. Uh, okay, let me, there's something else I needed to, to mention. I'm sorry. Let me, let me just mention it first. Eh? So when you send a packet here, of course, switch B is going to update its MAC address with the MAC address of host A and also the interface by which it has been connected, G003. On the other hand, if this guy sends a reply, again, it's going to be forwarded like this to switch A, to switch B, and to this guy. So when switch B receives the, up, uh, the reply, it's going to update its MAC address table with the MAC address of B and the interface via which it received that frame, G002. So I hope that is clear. So that is what I had not mentioned there. Eh? So now, what happens when the root port goes down? Uh, this is going to be made the new root port. This guy is going to be made the new root port and this alternate port is going to be uh, made the designated port. Uh, so it's going to be enabled. So now look, if we need, if we want to send data to host B, if we need to send data to host B, now if we send a packet here, host B will check its MAC, switch B will check its MAC address table, check MAC address table, if I want this guy B, I send this packet out through G002. You can see it here. I send it out through G002. So this guy is still going to send it out through G002. But when this guy sends it now to this guy, what happens? That path is not reachable. That port is simply out. Hmm. So that's the kind of MAC address table instability that uh, can be generated by this particular problem. So for that particular purpose, by default, we, we have to keep this at minimum. So by default, after every 300 seconds, we have to delete uh, an entry that has stayed for more than 300 seconds in our MAC address table in order to reduce the chances of uh, uh, MAC address instability caused by an indirect link failure. So, we talked of uh, two types of BPDUs. We talked of two types of BPDUs. The first type of, uh, so two types, sorry, two types of BPDUs. The first one we say is called uh, a configuration. A configuration BPDU. BPDU, and the next one we said it's called a TCN. So here we are looking at the TCN, a topology change notification. So this, this will assist us especially to, to understand how we can avoid this problem, hmm. how we can avoid this problem. So by default, we've said again, MAC address entries expire after 300 seconds, but that is still a lot of time uh, because after five minutes, your tenant will reach B, it's a lot of time. So using the TCN, 
we are able to reduce that time because we can be able to send what we call TCN BPDUs. So TCN BPDUs are sent upstream from a device, a downstream device towards the root. Now, the purpose of the topology change notification is to notify the purpose of TCN is to notify the root of a failure that has occurred within the topology. So it can be a direct link failure or indirect link failure. So whenever that occurs, then that particular device where the failure has occurred has to generate a TCN. Now, the TCN, uh, the TCN has uh, what you call two types of flags. The first flag is called the topology. The topology change flag or TC. And the other one is called the topology change acknowledgement or TCA, these two flags. So upon receiving a topology change uh, BPDU, the root bridge will generate a BPDU with both the topology change, with both the topology change and the topology change acknowledgement bits set. Why? in order to notify uh, of the topology change and to inform the downstream switches that the root bridge has received. The root bridge has received the TCN BPDU. So what, that, what does that mean exactly? So a failure has occurred somewhere on a switch here. So we create a TCN BPDU and send it towards the root. When the root gets it, it will create a new BPDU with the topology change and the topology change acknowledgement bits set to one. So normally they are zero. Uh, so TC and TCA. Let me, let me just check here. Uh, where is it? Okay, I can't be able to see it. Okay, so what happens is this, the purpose of the topology change is to actually tell these other switches that there has been a change in the topology. So telling these downstream switches, hey, there have been a change in the topology. There have been a change in the topology like that. So everyone will, will get that, that there have been a change in topology. Now, once you, get, once you get that notification that we've had a change in the topology, what happens is that you clear, you flash, you flash your MAC address entry uh, in order to avoid MAC address table instability. Mm. So really, that is, that is the purpose of the topology change. Uh, then we have this flag, the topology change acknowledgement, is now used when this BPDU gets to that device that generated the TCN, then the TCN is going to stop generating, is going to stop generating more TCN BPDUs. Because it means that, hey, the root has had me, and he has notified the rest about the failure. So that's the purpose of the topology change acknowledgement. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, 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 the device that has, has, has experienced a failure will continue sending the TCN BPDU. So I hope that is clear. OK. 
Oke. Okay. So this is how we do the topology change mark refresh. Uh, this is how we do the topology change mark refresh. Or uh, once there is a failure, we we send the TCN BPDU, then everyone will delete an entry. Everyone will delete an entry uh, that is associated with that particular switch. So here, we have switch B, and switch B has an entry for host B. So when this fails, when this interface here fails, we are going to send, we are going to send a TCN BPDU towards that direction. Then it's going to get to the root like that. The root is going to send a BPDU telling people to change, to change their uh, uh, any path that is associated with switch C. And therefore, this is going to be crossed out. And now because this is going to be enabled and this one, now packets from host A, frames from host A, will now be forwarded over that route. And when that happens, switch B again will update. It will update its uh, MAC address table. So that is what we call topology change MAC refresh. So I already talked about the STP mods. We have three. By default, uh, we use uh, we use MSTP by default. So in your switch, if you enter the command STP space mod, then use the complete help question mark, then enter, you're going to see the list of the possible STP mods. In this particular example, we just want to use the D, the, the STP, the normal STP. So we are going to enter the, the command STP mod STP. Then we can assign uh, the root port. So if we want a particular device to be a root port, we can alter the STP priority of that device. In this case, we want switch A to be the root. So we change the priority to 1496. The default priority, bridge priority is 32768. So when you don't change it, then they're going to use the MAC address to determine who becomes the root bridge. So this time we are configuring that using the command STP priority. Then we enter that particular value. We can also change the, the path cost standard that we want to use. Uh, using the command STP uh, path cost standard, STP path cost standard, like that. So you can specify one of these. As we said, Huawei by default uses IEEE 802.1T. Alternatively, you can also specify a cost for a particular interface. In this case, we are going to this interface, G001 in switch C, this interface. And we are simply specifying its cost manually in order to prefer it maybe as the, as the root port for that particular switch. So we are, we are changing the cost and we are using the cost of 2000 for that particular interface. So our calculation is not going to be done. Then we have what you call the root protection. The root protection. Root protection prevents changes to the topology as a result of root bridge transition caused by receiving a better BPDU, a superior BPDU. Let me just drag this. So caused by receiving a higher priority BPDU. Eh? So as I said, uh, so this is your network. This is your network. And switch A, you've configured switch A to be uh, 
to win the election. But this is what happens. If you interconnect another switch, maybe switch D, if you interconnect another switch, maybe switch D, to this network, switch D is going to send uh, BPDUs claiming to be the root. And indeed, if switch D has a better bridge ID, then the election is going to be, to be done again and switch D is going to be elected. But if you do not want switch A, you don't want STP to be preemptive, you don't want switch A, kutupiliwa uh, mbali na any other switch. You can do that by using this feature we call uh, BPDU, uh, root protection, root protection. So how do you do that? You go into the particular interface on your switch, then you use the command STP root protection. So even if it receives uh, BPDUs that are superior than itself, it's still going to maintain uh, uh, as the root port, uh, as the root bridge, sorry. So we can always confirm several details about STP uh, by configuring, by typing the command display STP. Here we can see, we can see that uh, the root bridge uh, ID, uh, that my root, uh, we are in switch A. So my root bridge ID is that, and I can also see that this is the root, the root bridge, cyst bridge is actually the root bridge. So in this case, they are the same because this particular device is actually the, uh, is actually the what? This particular device is actually the root bridge. So we can also see the hello timer, which is two seconds, the maximum edge timer, which is 20 seconds. Then we have forwarding delay timer. By default, it's usually 15 seconds. And uh, where where is it? Oh, here we can see BPDU protection protection is disabled. So we are going to learn about BPDU protection in a short while. Uh, if we go lower on that particular output, we're also going to see that we've we've done root protection. Root protection. Okay, so that is it. That topic has been quite long, but eventually we are done. So can someone, can someone help us with these two questions? Okay, are you guys there? Okay, so just go through these two questions, then try to answer them if you cannot refer to the answers that are just below it. Is that okay? Yes. That's fine. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Anyone with a question, by the way? <laughs> ah, yeah. Asante ni sana. So, uh, I think we're going to take a lab break so that you do the STP lab then we can come back and do our STP. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>